Okay, so last time this podcast, I mentioned I wanted some fresh blood, some fresh faces. We brought on to Rome Battle, and this week, as we go once a week, we bring on a throwback. Uh, one of my first guests here in this podcast a couple of years ago, Bob Sosi, a long time radio voice of the Patriots. Bob, two years ago, I was sitting in a hotel in Milwaukee, and you were gracious enough to talk to me for like 90 minutes ahead of the Patriots 2022 uh schedule i don't know why you took all that time in may i was in milwaukee to cover a basketball game i'm still covering basketball games but i'm very very happy to have you back on two years later well i'm i'm very happy to be with you andrew Sarone is definitely fresh he, he's outstanding and i'm glad you had a chance to talk with him i hope that i'm not stale as i probably was a couple of years ago when we talked from milwaukee but uh yeah and, and i hope that you're covering the celtics again uh you know through the uh, through the conference finals into the NBA finals all the way to a championship parade this year. Well, I appreciate you. Uh, and for the folks who don't know, first of all, you might be 18 or younger because you should have heard Bob at some point either on Super Bowl highlights, if not 98 by the Sports Hub, where he's been for more than a decade. Read and hear his work there. Father, husband, very thoughtful questioner, Bob Sosa. Even so polite as to punctuate, I think all of your text messages. I was scrolling back up for because you see, you asked me before we started. Hey, can you send this link, this video link, to my personal email? And you missed the question mark. So you followed up with a separate question mark, wherein we have other guests, this Rinky Dink little podcast, uh, Mike Giardi, who, who delete all of their text messages within a day. He's some sort of serial cheater uh, or, or a double agent or Russian spy. I don't know. But uh, anyway, proud to call you a friend. Thank you again for coming on and, and being fool enough to join this podcast where we have people like Mike Giardi on. So well, I appreciate uh, that. I'm flattered by that. Giardi is far too cool to use punctuation. <laughs> <laughs> He's too cool for a lot of I, things. I can get by without it. Some of us yeah. can. You know, us nerdy types. For sure. Okay, so the plan here today is to obviously go through the Patriots schedule. We are going to go what was once quarter by quarter. This was a very lovely, symmetrical, even 16-game season, four slots of four. Uh, now we have 17, and it bothers some folks of us that kind of love their even numbers and their symmetry. But before we get to that and upsets to watch and the best games and certain matchups and Bob's wild card crazy thoughts as he goes to all of these games on the team playing and tries his best to reign in Scott Zolak uh, before, during, and after these games, I want to talk about David Andrews because – David Andrews got a contract extension today, and on this last episode, I was asked and corrected an answer I had actually two weeks ago about, okay, who's getting the next extension? My original answer was, oh, come on, no one. No one's getting a Christian barmore size bag, a Bob Sosi bag contract um, that we have. And then I corrected that saying David Andrews would and Matt Judon would be my top candidates. It's a one-year extension. It's $12 million base through 2025, so this is over the next two years. $13 million max, but the number we should all really care about is $8 million guaranteed. When you saw this news break, Bob, I think we were chatting with Tyquan Thornton, if not um, maybe Jacoby Brissett. I don't know if you were there for the second interview today. Just your first thought. You see the tweet come across. Field Yates tweets this, and your thought was what? Well, you know, it goes back to the press conference we had with David last week when he talked about the decision to come back to the Patriots and then predating that, Andrew, uh, an event that I did with Mark Bertrand from 98.5 and David for one of the station's advertisers late last season when he was asked about the prospect of coming back and returning to the Patriots. And although he had time left on his contract, he pointed out to the audience, I don't have any guaranteed money on my contract, so I'm not sure they're going to want me back. And, and so after seeing these contract details, you know, you start to put things together and it makes a lot of sense that you know, this I imagine you're the reporter. You are the far better. Re you're, you're, you're an outstanding reporter, by the way. And I am flattered by your compliment regarding punctuation because you're also a terrific writer. <laughs> but you, you, it's you, just you, a text, Bob, but thank you. <laughs> you start to connect the dots and so forth. And it, and it makes a lot of sense to me. I think David would have, you know, had wanted to be a Patriot. Uh, I didn't think last year when the season ended that he was likely to walk away from football. Uh, I certainly, you know, am a big fan of his, as you know, as much of a fan as a broadcaster can be of a player. I think there are so many intangibles and qualities that he brings to the team. And I, I did wonder as well, though, you know, new offensive line coaches, new scheme. He's getting up there in years. Now they did get 100% of the snaps out of him last year. How long would they foresee him as being their center, particularly with all the interior offensive linemen that they've drafted in recent years? But I was, I was happy to see they were able to give him this money. They are able to work out this deal. I think it's it's due. Um, 
but I also think that there's probably a connection between his decision to come back and the news today. Yeah, no question about it, right? Like, I'm going to come give you my best. He's going into his age 32 season. This is the fragile stage of the rebuild, right? Like, the infancy of what they hope grows up to be, you know, maybe not another dynasty, but certainly a, a contender. So these are formative years for Drake May, for Gerard Mayo as a head coach, for the changes in the program. A guy like David Andrews is carrying out that culture. All the buzzwords we want to talk about and describe the Gerard Mayo and the energy and the, the newness of it all. Okay, it's great when Gerard's speaking in front of the room, but as soon as he leaves – it's guys like David Andrews in the team meeting, in the locker room, at practice that carry that out when coaches aren't looking. So I think this is a wise move given where they are as an organization with the young quarterback and just who he is. Uh, Seven-year captain. I, I wrote that today and was stunned. He's been a captain longer than I've been on the beat. And this is a guy who was drafted just in 2015, which makes him the second longest tenured uh, player on the Patriots, just behind your friend, Navy alumnus Joe Cardona. But it's by a day because Joe gets signed. It might even be an hour. Joe gets drafted in the fifth round of uh, 2015, and then David Andrews signed as an undrafted free agent. But uh, anyway, smart move. Uh, I will tease I have a, a story, a project coming up with David. Uh, I, don't, I don't know when, but I, I was happy to see this for him. I think it's good business. It's a fair rate, and anyone on the outside should be happy. Yeah, you uh, know, and just can I quickly add, too, speaking oh, of yeah. the fair rate, when he signed his first extension, because he's he signed a couple of team-friendly deals, before he almost walked out the door through free agency and took less from the Patriots to come back to New England, he had signed a second contract as a pro that I remember Joe Banner, the former executive with the Eagles and the Browns on social media, saying, this is a terrible contract. <laughs> well, so he definitely played ball with the Patriots. It's good to see the Patriots playing ball with him, as you mentioned, a seven-time captain. Well, and let's... I'm glad you brought that up because that's an important backdrop of this where I don't know if a guy like David would give voice to details about his contract like you mentioned at that event. Oh, I don't have any guaranteed money. Now, he's not one to shy away from the truth, but he goes with the program, which for a long time was do not talk about contracts, do anything but talk about contracts publicly. And there he is talking about a contract. In 2021, he got that deal done, I think, in the second day of free agency. And what had happened was the Patriots brought back Ted Karras uh, who had been, you know, their starting left guard at times, their center when David Andrews missed, I think, the 2019 season due to blood clots and said, well, we're just going to run it back with him because, you know, you want too much money. And so he came back, limped back on a four-year, very, very cheap deal. That last year was coming up the season, but now he's staying. He's got his guarantees uh, and will play presumably through age 33 uh, for the New England Patriots. And I think they will be better off uh having him here okay let's get to the schedule the rest of this podcast is brought to you by game time where if you've been listening the last couple of weeks you know they are a new sponsor and i don't say this because you know i i like to do ad reads for fun or just because they are sponsoring or i'm some sort of professional like bob who can speak things into his existence like bigelow tea into the cupboards of my apartment which is a real thing because of how convincing you are and your dulcet tones he's got the bigelow tea right now for the folks on youtube they can see it I say this because I use game time. I sit outside Fenway at 404, as I did Saturday, and bring a friend from out of town and take him to the Red Sox game because it's the lowest price guaranteed. So we are going to talk about Patriots games that are at home. I would encourage you to go to Foxborough. And if you don't like the ticket prices, wait, hang out. If you miss the opening kickoff, fine. It's not that exciting anymore. Um, it might be more exciting, actually, but I don't think it will be. Use game time. They've been very good to us. They will be good to you. Lowest price guaranteed. Flash sales, everything. Okay, week one. You cannot wait uh, in Foxborough because Patriots will be in Cincinnati. Let me rattle off the first quarter of the season. We are, again, going to go pick our best games, our upset picks, our most intriguing storyline, and then just a wild card random thought. Hopefully we do these in five minutes. Bob, I don't fully believe in us and getting in and out in five minutes, knowing you and knowing me, but we're going to give it a try. At Cincinnati in the opener. Versus Seattle in week two. At the Jets, Thursday night. Their only primetime game in week three. And then at San Francisco in week four after a long layoff. Um, like the rest of these games, the Patriots are going to be underdogs. They have the lowest over-under win total in the league, the exception of Carolina, five and a half. What is the best game in your mind of those four? And the best game from a Patriots point of view is the second game against Seattle. It's the home coaching debut of Gerard Mayo. Uh, as someone said to me last night, texting back and forth, reacting to the schedule, initially this person said 0-4. Oh, 
and then this person said one and three. Uh, you know, I, I think Seattle represents, you know, when you look at it on the surface, uh, if you don't have skin in the game, if you're not a Patriot partial, if you're not the Patriots broadcast, you might say Cincinnati with Joe Burrow, presumably, the Jets with Aaron Rodgers, presumably, San Francisco reigning NFC champion on the road, the Patriots' best chance to get a win is Seattle. But I just think the circumstances of that game in Foxborough, the first game as head coach for Gerard Mayo at the stadium that he called home for eight seasons as a Patriots linebacker, that to me is the best game for that reason alone. But as well, I think it's probably the best matchup overall. The Jets, will, you know, it's a divisional game. It's a Thursday night game. So the Patriots go in there on a short week, which makes it additionally difficult for them. Again, presuming that Rodgers is out there. That should be a fun one too, but I think it's Seattle week two. I'm with you. There is so much newness, so much energy. It's a home opener. Even if they get blasted in week one, you go, okay, it's one out of one out of 17. All right, they're coming back home. It's a lesser Seattle team. This would be, I think, if you were to list the four or five teams you would feel most confident the Patriots could be, they're somewhere in that list. I don't know, again, if I'll pick them. It's so early to pick games. I would discourage anyone from consuming that kind of content uh, unless you just absolutely feel compelled to because there's so much yet to happen. Mini camp, training camp, preseason, injuries, breakup players, all these things. It will be the best game because I think it will be the closest. A uh, lot of newness here with the systems offensively for the Patriots, offense and defense of the Seahawks, a lot of unknowns. That said, it is not my upset pick, even if I think it will be the closest game. For the upset pick of this first quarter of the schedule, I'm looking at week three, Bob. I, Thursday night, a Jets team that they know, a Jets team that does not know them quite as well, and plays a simplistic type of defense where, okay, it's a short week. Well, we know you're going to be running a ton of quarters, a good amount of cover three, and let's say it's even Drake May. He, at that point, probably would have been on the road, possibly at Cincinnati playing. You know, Aaron Rodgers certainly is, is a question mark, but I think that's a team that they can hang with uh, for all the reasons I just mentioned, not meant, not to mention just playing on short rest. Yeah, I think you know the the other thing about Rodgers too, coming off the Achilles, how is he going to be? As you mentioned, there's the divisional familiarity with it. The Jets do have a good defense, but it's not necessarily a complex defense. The Patriots are are very well schooled in what Robert Sala does schematically. What what those guys off the Seattle tree do, you can better explain covers. Uh, quarters coverage, we cover it three than I can. That's that, again, that's more your realm than mine. Uh, but I think the thing that I do worry about that is going on the road, even though it's a short trip, it's a Thursday night, you're coming off the home opener. I do believe the Patriots have a great shot. Again, that it, you're right, it's foolish to think about picking games at this stage. We have no idea what the roster is going to look like in week two, let alone, you know, in week two of training camp. We tour the preseason. Uh, but I, I do think that going to the Jets on a Thursday night, you know, Rodgers getting his, his first crack at the Patriots as the Jets quarterback, it's a tall order, but that would be the upset pick for me as well. Uh, you know, but I, I, I do think that from the Patriots' perspective, you know, they may not see that as an upset because of the reasons you laid out. They know the Jets well. It's a divisional game. And you know, they're going to go there with what they think is a very good defense, maybe the best defense in the in the division. For all the attention that the Jets' defense gets, I've got to believe that the Patriots have the confidence that they have the best defense in the AFC East going into this season. With Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app, where right now you can win up to a hundred times your money with as few as four correct picks with basketball hockey, in other sports on prize picks. And I'll tell you, look, I like prize picks for baseball too. The Red Sox just started up. They're playing the Mariners, the A's. I put a little money down and I got a lot more money back. So download the app today and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to a hundred bucks. I did the same. Again, download the app today. Use code CLNS at prize picks for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars and you can do the same. Basketball, hockey, and baseball. We got a lot to do until the draft and you can find it all at prize picks. Bob, how upset are you, if at all, that we can longer say the Patriots have beaten the Jets every single time, dating back to, and there are a lot of different ways to say this. My go-to is the administration that was in the White House because that gets your attention. Everyone knows what it was. And in December 2015, I remember um, Barack Obama was in office the last time until, of course, uh, the first week of this past January when the Jets won. 
but the force awakens like the first uh episode of the new sequel to star wars was in theaters at this time like you must have said that i don't know how many times over the years that the J patriots have just beaten the brains out of the jets are you as sad as i that that streak is over i am uh, you know i had to, <laughs> i used to always have to remind myself you know, how long it had been not necessarily going backwards to 15, but how many how many wins in a row? Is this 12, 13, 14? I, I, I think about the players that were on the field that day and a big reason why the Jets wound up winning that game in overtime after the Patriots won the coin toss and kicked off to New York. You, you'll remember that uh, Tavon Wilson had to go out and play in the secondary, and there was a pick play in Quincy and Nunua for the Jets. Right, like <laughs> 50 yards. It was, I think, a 48-yard catch and run to set up the game-winning touchdown to Eric Decker from Ryan Fitzpatrick. You know, Graybeard Ryan Fitzpatrick even then. Uh, so that's how long ago it was. And, and I kind of put an asterisk next to that win for the Jets last year for a lot of obvious reasons. Oh, okay. Considering the circumstances, you know, the, that enveloped the Patriots and their head coach, Bill Belichick, and the state of the offense at the time, the weather, all those things going into that game. So, like Tom Brady in 2015, at the end of that overtime loss, not shaking Ryan Fitzpatrick's hand, which Ryan has made sure to let everyone know he has not gotten over. You, Bob Lossi, would have not shaken the hand of Bob Wischusen, the Jets play-by-play -play guy last January, had that been a custom between the two radio announcers, because you said this is this is erroneous. I, I do not count this. Well, I don't know if Bob would have shaken my hand, Andrew, but I would give Bob a hand because he is a terrific broadcaster. I've enjoyed okay. his work immensely on the Stanley Cup. Let me just get that out there. But, uh, you know, us, us broadcasters, with, except, with a couple of exceptions, we, we, we tend not, you know, we tend not to see ourselves as, as rivals. We're all, we're all, you know, amiable colleagues up there in the booth. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, you know, I don't know how Bob feels about me, but I certainly have a lot of respect. For him and certainly appreciate his work a lot i just love the the spicy take you have which you've now since buried in politeness and very bob sosie way which is a bummer but i can yeah, still taste it the this win did not count we are still riding with the streak and you will still be scrambling is it 16 is it 17 is it 200 straight wins for the patriots when they play in week three on thursday night um but i'm curious uh let's let's go on to the most intriguing storyline again they're at cincinnati home versus seattle at the jets at the niners uh what's your most intriguing storyline for this basically september I think the intriguing storyline is, is the first game for me, Cincinnati. And it probably, you know, it has less to do. In fact, I shouldn't say probably. It has less to do from this point of view than with the Patriots than with Cincinnati. It's Joe Burrow and Cincinnati and him returning to quarterback. This is a team that obviously has had high aspirations since winning the AFC Championship a couple of years ago, derailed by injury last year after the disappointment the previous season and the postseason. This is a team that's had a couple of high-profile veteran players who've been part of their success to ascend in the conference that are openly seeking a trade at least you know if, if, if they're putting it out there for contract reasons it's nonetheless it's out there and and i i think it's a very intriguing game from the standpoint how does cincinnati come out and play this home opener against the patriots given the continuity that cincinnati has relatively speaking compared to new england in its first game going on the road under a new head coach with largely a new coaching staff. So I'm going to go to the last game, uh, as you hit on the opener there of this this first quarter, San Francisco. I, I want to talk about, I want to break down, I want to write about Gerard Mayo versus Kyle Shanahan. Because even if the Patriots are 0-3, as the odds would suggest, here in the middle of May, which means nothing, but in all likelihood, when we get to early September, that's what will also be the most likely outcome. You know, you want to get the best teams early in the season, right? When things that I think there's a, a wider variance of outcomes before they've settled in, they've built their habits, established their identity, all of these different things that sound like cliches, but are real when you talk to the guys in the locker room and the coaches on the sideline. San Francisco is wildly talented, both sides of the ball, better team. They're at home. They should be comfortable. They should be ready. But if Gerard Mayo is, you know, impressing as he does all of his teammates now and the opposing coaches with his, you know, schemes and game plans and adjustments, Show us, baby. Show us in San Francisco against Christian McCaffrey and Debo Samuel and Brandon Ayuk and George Kittle and Kyle Shanahan, supposedly the best offensive mind in football. And I want to see what that looks like. Because even if they're a win three and they lose a close one to the Niners, that will be taken, I think, as a, a moral victory. 
And I think that's fair for a team that's rebuilding the rating NFC, NFC champions. Uh, excuse me. All right, let's get out of here as we are well past five minutes uh, on, a, on a wild card thought. Anything that's tangential to any of these games, a matchup, a restaurant, a road trip, something about these four games. You know, in terms of the road trips, we were talking about Cincinnati mm-hmm. slash Northern Kentucky. Now, I, I was going to college in Dayton, and I worked in Cincinnati during the summers for the Reds. And I, I thought Cincinnati was the greatest city in the country. Now that I've gotten around to see other major league cities. Poor sweet Bob. Sweet yeah. innocent Bob, yeah. And then there's the Jets. You're going to you know, northern Jersey, the Meadowlands, tri-state area. I'm not sure where we're going to stay yet. And then there's San Francisco. And you know, so, so my wild card thought is I'm going to take full advantage uh, with that Saturday before the Patriots 49ers game. I don't know if this qualifies as a wild card thought. Uh, and maybe get to what I think is still the best baseball stadium, the best baseball park uh, that I've been to. Maybe PNC Park is right there. But what I still consider Pac Bell Park, yes. Willie May statue out front, you know, McCovey Cove, the Giants are playing home against the Cardinals on that Saturday. So you know, I don't know if this is wild at all. It's probably about as far from <laughs> wild as you get in San Francisco in the Bay Area. But you know that's already on my radar. But it, it, I'd also add, I think you're, you're onto something with the Niners. I think that is a game that should be really uh, in, intriguing. Uh, maybe not the most intriguing to me, but m- my wild card thought is that I think the Patriots can hang with the Niners for the reasons uh, that you described. And there are some people that believe maybe the Niners are going to take a step back this year. We'll see. Yeah, I, I like that. I will be at that game. I have already checked. There is a Saturday Giants-Cardinals game. I've never been to, I think you rightfully call it, Peck Bell Park. Uh, I, I've only seen it 12 years ago from the outside, but I think they were preparing for or cleaning up the Cheez-It Bowl. So the lamest possible uh, setup and scenario which to experience this beautiful ballpark right in the water. It was late December. I was in college, and no one cares anymore about that, so we'll move on. But I'm with you there. My wild card thought would just, just be the tackles. Like, we're going to be talking about the left tackle position all spring. All summer, um, you know, Nick Bosa's on here. One of the best defensive lines in football with the Jets is on there. Seattle beefed up its pass rush. And then Trey Hendrickson, who's getting up there and a little irritated with the front office in Cincinnati, they're going to – this position is going to be stressed right away. And so I, I'll be curious if the Patriots have to pivot when they go into the second quarter, quote-unquote, of their season against these teams. Miami at home in week five. The Texans at home in week six. At Jacksonville, quote unquote, the London game in week seven, and then home again versus the Jets. So three home games, one road game across the pond, and this will take us through the end of October. Your best game when you think about versus Miami, versus Houston, quote unquote, at Jacksonville, and then home against the Jets is what? I think Miami. I think the Miami. I if if not Houston, I think the, I think the, I think the Dolphins defensively. Our, our team that sustained some losses after last year. And, and again, you go back to the divisional familiarity the Patriots will have with the Dolphins. And the Pats have been right there with Miami these last couple of years, if not for their own mistakes offensively or ineptitude offensively. And, and granted, you know, it's likely going to be Jacoby Brissett. Uh, there are a lot of unknowns, including the tackles. And it's a great point that you bring up regarding the offensive line in particular for the Patriots. But I think Miami's the best game. I agree. I don't think we need to explain it uh, that much. You know, the Christian Gonzalez element, right, provided he's healthy. Does he shadow Tyree Kill? Is he established and earned that trust to that point? What do they do for Hill and Waddle and Tua, obviously, who has given them tons of problems ever since he got into the league, granted with a little bit of luck and health in, in certain games. Uh, but I, I think it'll be the most competitive. The the history there gives us some meaning and the chance that if the Patriots win, it's not only just you beat a team that should be a road favorite, they're in your division. It means a little bit more. That's not my upset pick, though. My upset pick, because again, if you're picking the Patriots to win in 2024, it's probably going to be an upset, Bob, is Jacksonville. And that will be in London. I think it's a team uh, that's vulnerable. It's a team that classically looks and is higher rated on places like Madden, where the talent just doesn't seem to always rise up uh, or meet you know the performance on the field. There's something missing here with this team. And I think a team like the Patriots, who I would bet at this point in the year begin to outperform expectations or, or play outside of themselves, could easily beat the Jags. And what, let's be honest, is going to feel a neutral psyche. Yeah, no, you know, Andrew, I, I think the Houston Texans are, are a team that will be interesting to watch considering 
the season they had last year, the way they surprised everybody with the rookie quarterback and a new head coach. And now they're being treated like a team that's been at the top for more than just one year. The primetime schedule this year of television games in the NFL is treating the Houston Texans of today like the Houston Texans that were perennial division champions in the AFC South. And depending on how they start that first quarter of the season, I think you know that's going to be, for me, a potential upset pick for the Patriots, presuming Houston comes in here as the favorite truth they should be. Uh, you know, but nonetheless, I think that's a game at home. You know, we'll, we'll see uh, with the Patriots going up against the Houston Texans. How will they handle the prosperity of the way last season went for them and whatever happens early this coming season, particularly if it's not as prosperous as many expect it to be? And that's – Exactly leads me into my next point is that teams like the Texans, I think, you know, or, or teams with expectations by week six, you really have to start turning things around. Like I, I remember vividly watching because I did not travel. I had a wedding this weekend for the Patriots game at Vegas, right? They're coming off of those disastrous games at Dallas in New Orleans. You're going to the Raiders saying, okay, that's only like a two and a half point. Play. The Raiders aren't that good. You need to win now. They don't. And I'm writing sell at the deadline. I know it's two weeks away. You're one in five. It could be worse. It probably should be worse based on your point differential. And so if you're the Texans there, all of the pressure, the expectations, right? You know, you added in free agency. You've got some real pieces, a rising quarterback. You know, if you're two and three coming into New England, there's a little unusual pressure that teams mostly don't face at that point. You can come back from two and four. I'm not saying that'll be the start, but some team with expectations is going to be in that same position come early, mid-October, that's where you would want the Texans if you're the Patriots and especially at your place. And I think that might play a role for what's a young team, like you said, that's not used to this stage in this this spotlight. Uh, my most intriguing storyline for this group, again, home versus the Dolphins versus the Texans at the Jags and then uh, versus the Jets, is the, the team building that Nick Casario did, sticking with the Texans, right? Because everyone is going to look at that and say, oh, they built the roster up first and then they put in the quarterback. And we were having this whole debate all offseason, my guy, your guy, Tommy Curran, <laughs> build up the team first, forget the quarterback, trade back, trade back, trade back. Well, Drake May is here, and the rest of the roster, not exactly here yet. So I think there, you will see a lot of pieces. I might write one myself. Uh, paralleling, if that's a word or could be a verb, please tell me and correct me if you can. Uh, what Nick Casario did in Houston, where there were a lot of other variables and ownership changes and head coaching issues and um, you know Jack Easterby mucking things up, versus what the Patriots have decided to do with their rebuild and how they progress from here. Yeah, I think there's also that that other storyline that here's one of Bill's protégés, mm. uh, somebody who thinks like Bill in a lot of respects, talks like Bill, certainly sounds <laughs> like him at, at the podium. I you know, was bred in the Patriots organization you know, from, from the time he first walked into an NFL front office, went down to Houston, and, and he did some things differently than – Bill Belichick tree would have done things and some of the some of the moves that he made uh, and some of the players that he picked maybe necessarily would not have been as high on the board, I think, with the Patriots as they were for Nick Casario down in Houston. But nonetheless, there is that you know old Belichick connection now versus the Patriots, this new era with all these Belichick connections still on the coaching staff and Mayo and some of the others who were there and in the front office and scouting and so forth. But the new executive vice president, Elliot Wolf. And I just think that's an interesting storyline that will be part of the subplot to that game as well. All right, your wild card thought. Well, well you went with football in the first part. I, 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 I misconstrued. I thought the wild card thought was supposed to be a little bit outside of the football box. I mean, this is not a wild card thought by any stretch, but I'm glad to be going to, to London rather than Jacksonville. I'm very excited about <laughs> that. Wow. What a shock. Yeah. But to your point, okay, now you're talking by the time you go to London, you're six games in going into that game. And I've already seen people react to the schedule trying to identify what is the space and where's the space in the schedule? What's the spot? Because the buy is too late, but there's this mini buy, but that might be too early. When do the Patriots transition from Jacoby Brissett to Drake May? I think you get around to week seven, week eight. And if Jacoby Brissett and the Patriots offense is stagnant and if they're not competitive in games, uh, then 
well, people are going to be asking those questions, if not calling into 98.5 the sports hub more angrily than ever. Calgary <laughs> Maz making statements demanding for that quarterback change. That's a high bar, angrier than ever. <laughs> well, yeah. not quite to the Danny from Quincy threshold, but you know, somewhere close to it. So if you were to bet when uh, Drake May makes his first start, what would your answer be? My bet is probably going to be, if I'm, and I'm not a betting man, and I'm the yes. wrong guy to. to You're very polite, <laughs> but up, do things the right way. Yes, we have established this, Bob. Okay, uh, I think it's going to be. Early. I I hope it's not, but I, I I just the way these things go, they usually end up a lot earlier than teams seem to want to make that move. Uh, that most people expect going in. Uh, I think if Drake May is ready, and. You know the Patriots feel confident based on some of the things they have said recently. Then, then he'll get the rain sooner uh, than later. Uh, and, and also, again, it, a lot of it just depends on how Joe, Jacoby Brissett plays and how this team starts. But it always seems to me that you know, despite the best laid plans of general managers, coaches, and offensive coordinators who want to turn things over to the young quarterback understudy later rather than sooner, he winds up out there faster than any of us expected. Okay, I want Spicy Bob back. I want Bob, who said the last Jets win does not count. It has an asterisk. It's BS. And extend a BS, you would have actually sworn. So give me a week. Give me a number. Because I, I would I would pick a week, a game in this stretch. And you I'll tell you after you tell me. You think yeah. it's coming back from London, going to the, playing the Jets at home? Or do you is that your guess? My guess, if it, my guess is if it's going to be in this stretch, then it's going to be after Houston. Okay, so going, Drake May makes his debut, not anywhere near family. Everyone has to come out to see him in London, which, hey, is 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 fun. Far away from Foxborough. As far away from Foxborough as you can. You're not in New England. You're in England, but you're not in New England. Get him away. As far away from Danny and Quincy as possible, (laughs) or whomever. If it's in the stretch, because the last thing I want him to do, honestly, is, is, is making his first start at home against the Jets. So maybe maybe you bump it up to week five. I mean, week six, rather, in Houston. But, uh, you know, I, I think it's probably somewhere, if, if we see him, it, it, it's somewhere in that period, whether it's after the Jets game or not. I wouldn't be surprised if it's week nine, week ten. But I think it's, I think it's probably somewhere in there if, if we see him, uh, you know, in, in that middle stretch. Okay. So my guess is, is week eight. And, again, this, this is a guess in the middle of May. They have not put on pads yet. They will not put on pads until the last couple of days of July. And then we will see the preseason. They will battle it out. Jacoby Brissett has been in this offense. Uh, He is a capable caretaker, and we'll leave it there. The reason I say the Jets is I think seven games at that point can tell you who you are, right? We're in late October. Belichick said this. You know who you are at that point in the season. You will know who you are with Jacoby Brissett if the Patriots want to make a change. They can do that then. Also because they will be seeing the Jets for a second time. So this might be Drake May's first game, but he will be at home. He will be against a team that he has already studied and or simulated if he's playing Aaron Rodgers on the scout team, which he might be, um, but will at least know what he's getting into as opposed to on the road, a team he's never seen before. Again, who the hell knows? We're going to be asking this just as we did. Who are they taking at number three for four months uh, moving forward? And then we'll find out whenever they do make the change, if they do at all. But that would be my guess right now. My wild card thought goes to the other quarterback, and then we'll move on to the next quarter of the schedule. What kind of crazy shit has Aaron Rodgers said by now? <laughs> like at this point in late October on Pat McAfee, is is he off of ESPN? Is he on ESPN more? Is he still, uh, is he like missing practices to stump for RFK Jr.? Okay, so the draft is behind us, but that means the best is still ahead of us. I'm talking playoff games, Celtics, Bruins, and I'll be there covering the Celtics with the Herald. We lost our guy, Steve Hewitt, which brings me to my real point. You want to come with? Because you can find Celtics playoff tickets, lowest price guaranteed at game time, an authorized ticket marketplace of the NBA, which makes getting playoff tickets easier and faster than ever. Prices on game time actually go down the closer it gets to tip off. You can find killer last minute deals, all in prices, including those pesky fees, views from your seat, and always, always, always the lowest price guarantee at game time, which takes the guesswork out of buying NBA tickets. And honestly, I've used game time for other games as well. 
I'm a couple tea stops away from the Sox. If I want to go to a home game, check out on game time, wait outside the gates. It starts, prices go down, boom. I'm in the park five minutes later with the lowest price guaranteed. So you can do this with the Celtics coming up in the second round. We all know they're going to the Eastern Conference uh, Finals. And then hopefully the finals. And you can be there right with them. Last minute ticket deals, flash deals, zone deals, all again, lowest price guarantee, even event cancellation protection, job loss protection, all at game time. So take the guesswork out of buying NBA tickets or MLB tickets, all with the Game Time app. Download the Game Time app today. Create a free account and use code CLNS for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms do apply. Again, the account is free. Download Game Time, create an account, and redeem code CLNS for twenty dollars off. That's Game Time today. Last minute tickets tomorrow and the lowest price guaranteed. Weeks nine through twelve. Here's the schedule. Still no bye week, by the way. Week nine. At Nashville, this is early in November. Week 10 at Chicago, home versus the Rams, and then at Miami, God bless, the weekend before Thanksgiving. It is going to be cool in South Florida. I am already excited to have a rental car and just kind of drive around, maybe catch a heat game, go to the beach. Um, What is the best game in that stretch? At Chicago. Oh. Yeah, I, I, and I always say that because I think or maybe this, this qualifies as the most intriguing storyline. If it is Drake May at that point, Drake May. Caleb Williams, the two quarterbacks in that game. But, you know, Tennessee, I think, is a winnable game for the Patriots, just based, again, on where the Titans are, new coaching staff, their personnel. You know, They're not going against Mike Vrabel and, and his institutional knowledge of the Patriots. It's not a team that is, is as good at coming off the kind of season that you know, we saw the Titans coming off of the last couple of times the Patriots played them under Vrabel. Uh, to me, Chicago is just a game that really stands out as – I think the potential for the best game overall, particularly if these these two young quarterbacks are out there. I like the Rams game, uh, partly just because I think it's at home. There's recent enough history, and I'm not even – I guess I really am talking about the Super Bowl, right? Uh, with McVay, I think it's a well-coached team. Christian Gonzalez against either Cooper Cup or Puka Nakua is going to be an excellent matchup. You know, Mayo is obviously going to have to come to play. Their defense has taken a lot of hits, and I think they outperformed. The Rams did what they did. Uh, what their talent was last year in making the playoffs and going to Detroit and forcing a very close game against the Lions. So I think that will be the closest. My upset pick, again, the, all of these are upsets, uh, would be Tennessee. I just don't believe in Will Levis, uh, and that's, I, I don't think, unreasonable. And the Titans over under win total is only six and a half. So it's one more than the Patriots. I'm not going out on a limb here, but if they're favored just by the standard three points at home, again, the Patriots winning. Still an upset. I think upset pick is the Rams. Uh, and, I, and I can see why you would, you believe that that would be the best game. I think, you know, the Rams minus Aaron Donald, the Rams with you know, the Patriots' familiarity with the McVay scheme and the success they had in 2018. I know McVay was a, a second-year head coach, I think, at the time. The Patriots don't have the personnel uh, offensively that they did in that game. <laughs> if it is a tight, low-scoring game to finally break through with Tom Brady throwing to Julian Edelman and Rob Gronkowski to get them downfield. But I think that's the, the best chance for an upset for the Patriots uh, in that stretch. Because I don't really look – I don't know if at Tennessee, at Chicago, the you know, again, at this stage, the road game, so we'll say they'll be underdogs. But I don't know if the, at that point if those teams are going to be better than the Patriots. But I think the Rams coming in here, that's a, an upset uh, candidate for me. Yeah, I, I think the Rams are just so well coached. It's hard for me to see them. I mean, it's not hard for me to see them losing. There, there's a way that happens. They're coming as far away as you possibly can to Foxborough uh, to play this game. But I just, you know, Miami on the road, we know what the House of Horrors is there. Chicago is a little bit of an unknown, a lot more talent, I think, than Tennessee. Uh, the most intriguing storyline for me, though, is something you already hit, you know, Caleb Williams versus Drake May. And I, I was tempted to go, Bob, runner up, second place, silver medal hanging around its neck, is that all the Patriots' most coveted veteran receivers in the last 10 months are going to be playing for the Titans. DeAndre Hopkins, uh, come on down. Calvin Ridley, right after him. Does Elliot Wolf say hi to them? Do they go, are you sure you want to stay here? You know, if they win, maybe we trade for you, uh, you know, in the offseason, try to make something work. You know, talk to Calvin Ridley's wife, not girlfriend. Uh, so that's that's what this is for me, though. The, the obvious part is the Caleb Williams versus Drake May because these are dynamic dudes. They they move around. They have cannons for arms. They create on their own and don't need a perfect situation to do so. You just hope that obviously they stay healthy enough because you know Caleb more than Drake is in a decent situation, uh, but maybe not enough you know to really protect him against what should be a really good Patriots defense. 
Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll go with maybe this is kind of a wild card thought too. Speaking of that Bears game, you mentioned earlier the comparison between the way Nick Casario built the Texans and the way the Patriots are going about it. Well, the Bears drafted Caleb Williams number one, but they also buttressed that offense a bit. They bolstered it by making some moves to give him some veteran help. And it's a good receiving core that Chicago has, especially in comparison to what Chicago had not too long ago. And, and I think that's an interesting dynamic going into this game as well, is that you know, they immediately turned it over to their first-round quarterback. But they also did a good job, it seems, at this stage, again, on paper, in the offseason, giving him some more help to try to ease that transition for him from college to the NFL. My wild card thought is I think the Patriots are glad these are one o'clock games in Nashville, in Miami, and in Chicago, because of this stretch it was a series of 425 games. And I know they have, you know, bed check uh, that they have to meet, obviously, at certain nights. But guys will sneak out. You know, this happens in pro sports, Bob. Those are markets. You want to go hang out. You want to go to the club. You want to go to the bar. It's a little harder when you need to get up at 7, 7.30, have breakfast, and then go to the stadium, which I don't know if that makes you feel better. I don't know what Zoe is up to on the road. But, like, everyone's got to show up for work here with these road games, and it's at 1 o'clock. Andrew, these guys are sports st stars. I mean, maybe not stars, but they're, they're, they're athletes. They're not sports writers. What kind of lives do you think they lead on the road? Uh, they, they could have a lot more fun than I do. And we think we're having fun by going to Cardinals Giants games on Saturday before a 49ers exactly. game. It will absolutely not count anywhere in the MLB standings. But there I am just sitting with my uh, popcorn and Cracker Jacks. You know, a good point, though, about the, the one o'clock games, because, you know, I look at the schedule. My first reaction when it, when it comes to the two NFC West road trips, they're not back to back. It's going to be tougher on the Patriots. Well, they both they see have, have both Seattle and the Rams at 10 a.m., Right, 10 a.m. Yep. their time. Uh, particularly, you know, again, we come in Seattle week two, so there's not that period where you know you get a team like that later in the season. Maybe they can double up. Maybe they can go out on the other coast and and practice there to try to get acclimated, get their body clocks on that time zone. You know, I think having those two games at one o'clock is is a break for the Patriots. Is that your wild card? That that that's my wild. It's good enough. It's Excellent. good as yeah. They're going to need some Bigelow tea to fire up, get themselves ready. Back right. I need something else in my Bigelow tea. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right, let's move on. The last quarter of the season. This is actually five weeks. Um, or it's, yeah, excuse me, five weeks. And so we will have the bye. Finally, December 8th, Patriots can kick back and relax after they've been practicing and playing in Pads since uh, late July. They will go at Arizona in week 14. Then it is, uh, excuse me, week 15 at Buffalo. Okay, just before Christmas, week 16, versus the Chargers, week 17. And then the calendar will turn, and they will be home against the Bills again. Two Buffalo games in three weeks. Again, the bye at Arizona, at Buffalo, versus the Chargers, versus the Bills. The best game, and this is going to be probably the most boring section we've done yet because they only have three opponents in four games. Uh, but the best game will be what? I think the Patriots and the Bills, regular season finale. Oh, okay. Why is that? You know, I, I think I think last game of the season uh, for New England. You know, I don't think anybody expects the Patriots to be playing with any postseason implications on the line for them. But nonetheless, you know, first year head coach, you ideally hope your team is coming together, that you're at least trending upward at that point. It's an opportunity to end the season on, on the right note. Two weeks after you've played the team in Buffalo, if there's any chance the Bills are going to be complacent, it's going to be in that second game. Coming in New England, you know, particularly presuming, assuming, I should say, that the Bills are going into that game where we would expect them to be as a playoff team, if not having already locked up a you know, playoff berth, certainly you know, as a team that's, that's headed for the postseason. They get the Patriots two weeks earlier. The Pats are going to be coming off that road trip to Arizona, so they don't figure to play as well going to Buffalo with a short week. Yeah, to me, I just think the, the way it lines up for the Patriots, the second game against the Bills could be uh, you know, the, the ripe opportunity for them to, to send a message but also to, to really propel themselves toward next year on that last Sunday of the regular season. So it's not my best game, but that is my upset pick for the reasons yeah. you mentioned. Finishing a strong note 
I think there might be questions if the Bills at that point are resting starters, right? Which, again, probably brings the spread down. I don't know if it would swing it all the way in the favor of a team that, again, is expected to have the worst record in the AFC versus a possible AFC champion. But at that point, I think the Patriots are at home. Uh, They're familiar with the Bills. Of course, that cuts both ways. But they beat the Bills at home just last year. And part of that, I think, was because it was earlier in the year before the Bills settled in, stabilized, solidified, like the icicles that will be hanging off Gillette Stadium when they kick off in the regular season finale in January 2025. But my best game is at Arizona. I think the rested Marvin Harrison Jr., Kyler Murray, like there's just fireworks that are just waiting to be set off in that game through the small opening uh, at that stadium down in Glendale. Will the Patriots bring their own fireworks? I don't know, but maybe Javon Baker, this is his game because I'm not totally sold yet and what's a lot of young talent on defense uh, with Jonathan Gannon, who, again, that's a coach and a team that outperformed expectations last year. Will they do it again? I don't know. Uh, does Kyler Murray need to be pulled off of Call of Duty to remember to come play the Patriots, what might be the one of their easier games of the season? Who knows? But I'm ready to find out, and I think it'll be the best game. Uh, what's your what's your upset pick? Is it also the last game? I'd say the the last game of the Bills. Okay. Easy enough. Uh, yeah, you know, and, 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 and but I'll, I'll pick up on the intriguing storyline because I think it's 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 a tie. It's the Arizona and Chargers game, more weighted with the Chargers coming in under Jim Harbaugh. I think the intrigue of playing these teams the we've seen in the recent past under different head coaches, and you mentioned Jonathan Gannon with the Cardinals and the impressions that I've had of Kyler Murray and the Cardinals team in general. The last few times the Patriots have played them, they didn't necessarily strike me in particular as a, a tough team, a, a tough physically, mentally, uh, as, as you know, the, the, we saw them here in Gillette in 2020, and then when the Patriots played out there against them and, and Kyler Murray got hurt, and the Patriots wound up winning that game when DeAndre Hopkins put the ball on the ground and, and, and Mary Kwan McMillan scooped it up and scored. Uh, but I think, you know, Arizona's taken on a different character, a different personality under Jonathan Gannon. And now, as you mentioned, Murray has Marvin Harrison Jr., uh, that's intriguing to me. Just you know, what's this team going to look like against the Patriots now? Is, is it a different Arizona Cardinals type of team than we've seen in the past? But it's the Chargers mostly because of Harbaugh and, and the personality that he will ultimately imbue in his team. Uh, it's a team that's been soft. Again, I hate to use that word, but they, beat, they, did, they, they, they were able to beat the Patriots last year 6 nothing. But I'm curious, if by the end of the year, under Jim Harwell, is Justin Herbert going to be the quarterback who thrives in those pressure situations? The, the last couple of years, he and that offense, you know, despite Brandon Staley's shortcomings, you know, didn't necessarily play well. In. So those are the two most intriguing for me. All right, honesty time, Bob. We had someone on this podcast, a fan, doing a, a male fan segment. You know, we've missed the last couple of weeks, but we're going to answer some mailbag questions here at the end. And this fan came on. He's from Virginia. Flew up for that Chargers game. Flew up for 6 nothing. Bailey Zappi's first start. And you're in the booth calling every single play of that miserable, bleeping game. One of the worst games you, you've called, period, in your career. Yes? Oh, absolutely. Okay, good. And probably, probably, honestly, probably the worst game I've called since Dan Orlovsky in Connecticut. You're oh, don't do it. The don't do the the My own podcast, Bob. Come on. <laughs> I don't even know what game you're referring to because Dan is by far the best quarterback to ever play at no, UConn. It was, it was Donald Brown. No, it's, it's not a shot at Orlovsky. It's just it was, it was it was a game at Navy, similar conditions, oh. rainy toward the end of the season. Navy, I think, had nearly beaten Notre Dame the week before, and UConn came in. It was UConn's best team in years. It was the first – uh, stint for Randy Etzel, and UConn came in and, 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 and beat Navy, shut him out but by a lot more points. Uh, so I, I was thinking about it last year watching that game because even in lopsided games, I have a job to do. I'm professional. I try to be at least uh, more professional on, on broadcast than I am necessarily in this setting. <laughs> and, but th- that game last year was such a grinder, and then the weather contributing to it. And just the, the set, late in the game, and I know Bill was questioned about this. You, you, you guys did a good job in the press conferences after the game, and then in the week thereafter, the, the Patriots' decisions to punt the ball it was—it was kind of—it it felt like a white flag game late in the contest, and it was played that way. It was just—it was an uninspiring effort, let alone performance. 
Spicy Bob is back. I'm so happy. Yes, an immediate, absolutely, that game sucked. Yeah, I don't like that you compared it to UConn, but you saved it. All right. uh, yeah, you know, UConn. That's good with UConn. I, no, I know, I know, I know. The game itself, uh, just like not necessarily knocking the Chargers, who's over under win total, by the way, even though Lad McConkey steps in day one as their best receiver. Again, Lad McConkey, who I like a lot as a prospect, second round pick, uh, is their best receiver. Eight and a half for the Chargers in Jim Harbaugh, which is a real, real surprise to me. The Broncos being twice in their schedule, I'm sure really helps. But look, for me, the most intriguing storyline here is can the Patriots play spoiler? And that's against the Bills. Again, two in their last three games. They might be sitting. Uh, the Bills might starters at the very end. They're not going to be sitting starters in, in week 16 when the Patriots pay them a visit just before Christmas uh, or around Christmas. I can't keep all of these straight. It is before Christmas. My wild card thought, though, is can we just stop scheduling games, two games, against the same opponent in a three-week stretch? I know it's my job. Like you said, I try to be professional in these press conferences. I think largely I succeed. I I don't I <laughs> I'm so glad I have six months to think about this. What are we going to ask Gerard and and players about the Bills and tell me about their defense and what the test is in this matchup? If the game doesn't matter to the Bills, you just saw them less than two weeks ago, and now you're going to go play them again, a team that you know so well and study. Like fans, no way can you get that excited about seeing the same opponent that again was two weeks earlier playing you in their own place, and then they come to visit. Like, I, Can we at least spread this out to four weeks, NFL, if we're going to accommodate requests for travel and timing and bye weeks and not fulfill all of them, by the way? The Patriots wanted to stay out west for the Niners and Cardinals games, and not because you, Bob Sosie, called them a million times. The league office has told me this. Um, <laughs> but can, can we just spread this out a little bit? Andrew, I said the same thing earlier today really? down to someone yeah absolutely and i don't want to be redundant here it, now from a selfish standpoint it, it does make the job of preparing one spotter charts i know that's a great concern <laughs> to the fan base and yeah. sport, to, you, to you writers on the beat it does make that part of the job for me easier it's just a matter of updating a few numbers but nonetheless i hate it we've been in this situation before preparing for the patriots and the jets twice in a three-week span i think uh, to, to have the schedule uh, all the way it does too. I hate the fact that, okay, they play the Jets twice in the first half of the season. You don't see them again as a division foe. You don't see the Bills like last year until the end of the season. Now you get them twice in, in three weeks. I hate that part of it. My wild card thought does relate to the Bills as well. What happens if Buffalo doesn't fare well, as well as expectations going into the season accompanying them? You know, oh, boy. Have everybody believing. Sean Burnett comes in to Foxborough week 17, or week 18, game 17. You know, there's a former Patriots head coach. Oh, there it is. He's out in the media. There, there it is. is. Well, you know, hey, I'm just saying. I'm just. No, say the whole, say the whole team right, name. It's right there. Right? Huh? The Buffalo. I, you know, to some of I, I think the wild card thought is, what if the Bills, in, in the minds of Bills fans, in the minds of Bills owner Terry Pagula, are underachieving by that stage of the season and aren't set up to have a successful playoff run? Or, or you know, I don't think this is going to happen, but wind up missing the playoffs. I mean, this team has gone through some substantial changes, and going into you know going into that stretch twice with the Patriots in in three weeks, what? The, What's it going to be like for McDermott and the Bills at this stage for him if they're not seemingly poised to make a deep run in the postseason and finally win that Super Bowl for Buffalo? Oh, my God. I'm ashamed of my wild card thought. I thought I was just, you know, fair, complaining uh, about games. You are suggesting that the Jets in a snowy regular season finale knock out the Bill Belichick era. And then the Patriots a year later, possibly back in Foxborough in a game that is likely to have inclement weather or at least freezing temperatures, play the Bills and then usher in the Bill Belichick era in Buffalo. The Buffalo Bill Belichick is what you just proposed. This is the spiciest thing that has been said in this podcast. Spicy Bob has to be here to stay. I want to get him to be the fifth or sixth co-host on uh, Rich Shirley's new show. <laughs> move over Michael Hurley and Mike Giardi and everybody. Definitely move over Mike Giardi. But uh, that was outstanding and i had not thought of that before and i'm ashamed that i didn't but i'm so glad you brought it to my attention the, the you know, Buffalo I, I, Bill Belichick's. it's 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 outrageous oh, it's come a, on. don't back away yeah. now okay, yeah, I, i've got to i've got to reel this back in now <laughs> <laughs> the genie's long gone yeah. um, look I, I i i felt this way last year and i don't know if i said this public but i think like you know people look at the, the cowboys 
as a potential destination still for Bill. Because I think Bill is still coach. And he's still a great coach mm-hmm. uh, in that kind of team. And I just wonder, like, and I've thought this since last year, and, and I know I'm not alone. Like, if you if you're Terry Pagula, like you. You, you watch the Patriots against the Bills, the way you, you reference the Patriots' win against Buffalo. And you go even go back to that wind and snow game in late December from Matt Jones's rookie season. And, and you, you, you're you in the division. You, you, you butted your head against his teams for years and lost. You finally get, thought you got over the hump, but you can't win that Super Bowl. You know, maybe the McDura, McDermott era, you know, is is whining toward an end. I don't. I think he's a good coach. I think he's done a tremendous job there. Definitely. But yeah, you know, the ex, like the expectations are what they are in Buffalo because of the success that he's established. But if the Bills were to fall short of that bar this season, then I, I think you know the wild scenarios could be in play by week eighteen of this season, and, and maybe they're not so wild. Maybe they are. Oh my God, I love it. Um, okay. I gave you two more questions at the end of the year. They're, they're fairly boring. Uh, and we have plenty of time to talk about that. So I, instead I'm going to spring a couple mailbag questions that you have not seen yet from our listeners and then we'll get out of here. How's that sound? Okay. Okay. Really quickly. This is from Carlos. Um, th- this is a tricky question because I think the, 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 the assumption when you hear this will be someone got fired. That doesn't have to be the case. It's not going to be my answer. Which Patriots coaches or coach do you predict will no longer be a part of the staff after this season, it could be a position upgrade on another team, a college job. And I would say to folks going, why are we firing coaches who have not stood on the sideline for a single game, even though they just got here or have been here and stayed over? Um, Drod Mayo said it's his understanding when he took the job. Your first staff is really doesn't look a whole lot like your staff in a couple of years here after. So if you had to name a coach who might be moving on for whatever reason after this season, do you have any that come to mind? You know, I... I... I think that there's, there's, I don't have a specific coach, but I would say that there, there are, I think, two possible lines of coaches. There are if Bill gets another job, or if one of Bill's confidants winds up in a position to be able to influence the hiring of coaches with another team in 2025, then maybe we see one of the the, the young coaches that were under Bill maybe move on for you know a, a better opportunity, a better title if there are you know if there is a title associated with the job well uh, and let's yeah. stop here and name them because i think there's really only one you know possible actually let's say two coaches on staff who fit that mold oh, right, there's, there's, you know and and, and, and you know there, there's brian and, and mike brian belichick exactly exactly brian belichick and, and mike delagrino and, and i really you know i i think the world of uh, brian and i think mike has done a great job in his position that's not advocating this critic like you said that these guys are going to be asked to leave no Gerard Mayo and not somebody else who wants them on his staff. But those would be the two most logical from Bill's line of coaches. And then, you know, the, I think somebody like a Tom Quinn, for example, the assistant special teams coach. He's been around for a long time. He's coached a lot of different people. He's going to be the assistant now to a first-time special teams coach. He's going to be very valuable based on what I've heard, what I've, what I've read and learned about his career in that role. But, you know, again, maybe somebody that he's more closely connected to, you know, winds up or someone like that. Andrew, you know, who's on this staff that, you know, I don't know if it's Bob McNell or somebody else who's on this staff now as a first year hire by Gerard Mayo, who might just see, you know, a, a better situation for himself somewhere else in 2025. It's very fair. It's very measured. It's uh, very well said. Bob, regular Bob is back. Spicy Bob is taking a break. Uh, my answer would, the only other name to add to this, because I think Mike Pellegrino and Brian Belichick pending, you know, Bill's next job. And look, I, I you know, I think I noted this around the time of the staff changes. If you think about Brian Belichick, not as a coach, but just as a person who has been here since 2000, right? And he, he's about as old as I am. I'm about to turn 33 uh, this summer. He has, he just, his wife gave birth to their second kid. They're going to want to stay close. He's been here since before he was 10 years old, right? There are roots here that are separate from his father. Everything obviously centers around the Patriots organization. Bill left, he's still here. Steve left, he was older. He knew a life before Foxborough and is, it seemed more willing to advance to something uh, beyond what his role would have been here. So Brian might want to stay. Uh, but the one the one name outside of those two that I would say is Ben McAdoo because I think Ben is someone who probably has aspirations of being an offensive coordinator again. Probably not going to be a head coach again in the NFL. But if he was, it would be Drake May has a great rookie season. He interviews for a job elsewhere gets that OC job, and then keeps moving up the ladder. 
Uh, but he has to obviously do a good job here with May, and he's going to be right in there with Alex Van Pelt developing the Patriots uh, franchise quarterback. Jordan is asking, quote, when should we expect trades for guys like Bailey Zappi and Juju Smith-Schuster? Already kicking them out the door, Bob. I definitely had no part in this. I've never done a segment about this myself in detail, the contracts and the dead money and everything that would be involved. Um, Jordan guesses the end of the preseason, but he hopes sooner because he doesn't want them taking reps away from the rookies. So if Bailey Zappi and Juju Smith-Schuster are traded, uh, you know, does the end of the preseason sound fair to you? Because I will share that that would be my guess uh, and my, my best answer. Yeah, I think they made it this far. I think Labor Day weekend, you know, after mm -hmm. the, the last preseason game before the regular season opener makes the most sense. You know, to me, I think it's interesting that Bailey still involved in the offseason working with receivers still has a good relationship. It seems with a lot of his teammates, um, you know, for me, he, he's probably going to wind up elsewhere. I wouldn't see the Patriots carrying him through the coming season. Uh, and that's not to say that I think Joe Milton is going to have a role necessarily uh, on this team. But I think you want to have Bailey around too. What, what if somebody gets hurt in the preseason? What if Jacoby goes down the preseason? Then you, you're going to need Drake, uh, Bailey Zappi, especially if you don't want if you don't think Drake May is ready in Week One to play the position. So I think it's a valuable asset to hold on to, but I think also a valuable asset to have. You know, after you know where you are at the end of the preseason, and other teams are going to be looking for somebody who could be a competent pinch hit quarterback at some point in time. The point about Bailey being a valuable asset still internally, not just to teams who will need quarterbacks, is a good one. Because, again, injuries happen. Uh, when I last answered this question, Nathan Rourke was still on the roster. They released him. Not that I ever expected Nathan Rourke to seriously factor into a quarterback competition, but in my mind could be a competent number three. Uh, and the Falcons and Giants agreed because they both put in waiver claims on him, at least among other teams. Now he's gone. And what I would say is Joe Milton, as much as I have uh, expressed my love for the idea of watching him throw balls 80 yards at 80 million miles an hour in training camp, is no guarantee to make the roster. He's a six-round pick. And if he bombs, as he very well could, well, then you need Bailey Zappi, regardless of anyone else being healthy, because you want three quarterbacks, I think, for this team and in this room. Um, but Juju, I would say, he could even be cut by, by Labor Day. It's just a matter of... He's just as good as Javon Baker, and we're going to roll with him and Polk and Bourne and KJ Osborne and Demario Douglas. There goes Juju one way or another. Okay, this next question is going to make you cringe, but Brian Russell is writing it, I think, for the first time, so I'm going to read it as it's written. Cool. I think Mayo is a scheming backstabber, having the succession clause in his contract, calling Kraft Thunder and his demeanor in general. Your thoughts would be appreciated. Love all your work, Andrew. Uh, to be clear, I'm not answering this question because the last line in that question I'm just going to say that, look, I think there is a lot of time and space that uh, certainly media, I think we're getting more accustomed to Gerard. Fans are going to take a while to get accustomed to Gerard, not only just because he's a new coach, because of the vast uh, differences between him and Bill, specifically as they pertain to the media and their public image. So Gerard calling the owner Thunder a loving nickname that isn't exactly for the reasons he explained in the press conference, but we'll go with it officially, is fine. That's their relationship. They put it in front of you. Whoever makes it feel makes you feel is not going to have a material impact on wins and losses when the games start counting in September. So I would just let that go. As far as the succession clause, look, Tommy Kern has reported uh, that there was an understanding between Kraft and Mayo and Belichick. Belichick basically had two years left. His contract ran through next season. So the plan was to hand the baton off after that. It's not like Bill didn't know about the clause. And so Gerard was a rising coach. He was the fastest rising coach from the minute he got in the building. Ran a position, never had coached a year before in his life. Bill handed him the keys. He knew what a talented, natural coach he would be. He continued his rise. Here he is. Uh, it's unusual. I don't think that no one shares your opinion, specifically people probably close to Bill, that Mayo is this backstabber. But I think if the president or the owner of your company said, hey, you want to be in charge after the guy at the top leaves and he's about to turn 73 and – you know, we think you could do the job. Are you saying no? Because I'm not. Well, you know, I'll, I'll start with the backstabber comment. Um, does this person think Bill Belichick was a backstabber when he was developing a relationship with the Crafts while an assistant to Bill Parcells? <laughs> Connecting with them on a level that was different than, you know, Parcells and them related because of their, their mutual philosophy about – cost and value of players and roster management and cap management and things of that nature? I don't think so. 
Bill is just being Bill. And Jonathan and Robert at the time saw this young assistant on their staff, I guess not so young assistant at that point, but, but someone that they had wanted to be the next head coach of the Patriots. And they, they waited, obviously, to, to hire him and, until after Pete Carroll didn't work out here. Uh, would Brian Belichick stay on board with Gerard Mayo? Would Gerard have the relationship he has with Steve Belichick, who did depart for the University of Washington, if, if they thought he was a backstabber to, to their father? I think the other thing regarding the press conference and Gerard's casualness, if you will, with, in terms of the way he related to Robert, the use of the nickname Thunder. And I think what we've learned since then, if we didn't know it already about Gerard and his dealings with the players, listen to what the young players are saying. The, the, the guys who went through the, the draft process who aren't even Patriots, who visited with Gerard Mayo at the Combine or were here on Top 30 visits and talk about the way he interacted with them the way the current players have talked about the way Gerard interacts as the head coach, no longer the assistant coach to them. That's, that's, who he, that's how he relates to us. That's how he relates to people in the building. That's who he is. I don't think it's inauthentic. I think that's just the way Gerard Mayo is as a person. Uh, and, you know, maybe some people were taken aback by that because we're not accustomed to seeing that. But I think what we're going to see more and more, maybe not, you know, in, in, in that way. But we're going to see more and more relationships like that between these coaches and ownership and, and, and different levels of management where it's not going to be the button-down uh, approach that we, we, we've we become accustomed to in the sports world for so long. And the other part of that for me, too, is, look, if you're Robert Kraft, you know, and I thought this from, the, like you, that when Gerard Mayo came, at, came in, into the building as a coach for the first time, there was a good chance he was going to continue to ascend and ultimately would be in line to be a, a head coach of the Patriots. This is a player that you you, you, can't, you saw come in, was an instant leader, captain second year, very bright. Someone had a real interest in the business world. You could relate to him on a level that's, that's above, you know, a plane of X's and O's with Gerard's interest in the business world and investing and some of the circles that he's interacted with during his playing and post-playing career in the business world and the investment world. But this is someone that, you know, is young, who's funny, who's got a great personality, who's got charisma, magnetism uh, on and off the field. He's a former Patriot. He's a former Patriot standout. Uh, he's a former Super He's a Super Bowl champion. But beyond that, if, and, and I know these guys didn't work out where they went. You watched young assistant coaches that you thought could be the next guy, perhaps, like Josh McDaniels, Brian Flores, walk out of your building. And then you've seen Gerard Mayo go interview with the Philadelphia Eagles. And you've seen Gerard Mayo, uh, you know, approached – by the Carolina Panthers and other teams. And you might say to yourself, and I'm, not, and I'm just thinking from you know, my point of view, not, not putting words into Robert's mouth or thought bubbles above his head, I'm not going to let this guy get out of my belt. I am not going to let him be the head coach of another team if we can line this up because Bill's in his early 70s. You know, It's winding down for him. I want to have a succession plan in place. And this is the guy that I've identified as the next head coach of the Patriots, and I don't want to lose him. Why wouldn't you take those steps to keep him in the fold a year ago? That's the way I look at it. Again, well said, thoughtful, very Bob Sosi of you. Um, I, I still miss Spicy Bob, but uh, I will add this too. The, the, the domino that really started, you know, the changing of the guard, Mayo and his head coach, Elliot Wolf is the GM, was 4-13. and It was last season. When this clause was put in, they had come off an 8-9 season that no one expected to continue to fall and decline the way that the franchise has in the losing did. Again, they expected to go at least two more years together. Bill did, Robert did, Gerard did. Again, last year was just his fifth year in coaching. And so the potential is there, the relationship was there, and that's uh, it's an unusual circumstance. Again, if you're off put by Gerard's demeanor, and I've written about what I think are small, uh, you know, small to medium mishaps publicly, spilled orange juice episodes, if you will, yeah. it happens. They're growing pains. He's going to have some. So is the team. Bob's not saying he's going to uh, lead this team to Super Bowls or a winning record this year even. I'm not saying that. But this is our view and how things went, why they did. And uh, we're moving on. All right, last question. Duo Customs. I don't I don't understand the handle, but the, the name is Duo Customs. And uh, the question is, will the Patriots sign a veteran left tackle like free agent Donovan Smith or Charles Leno? I understand they want to play and develop their younger guys, but let's not have a turnstile. On Drake May's blind side, either fair. I think it's more than fair. You know, Donovan Smith is a name that certainly 
uh, you know, is out there and, and it's been written about a little bit uh, of late. And, you know, you're, if, if your plan is to go with a guy that's a, a, a veteran, but not necessarily a left tackle and Chuka a core for, or if you're going to go with a projection of a guy who played right tackle throughout his collegiate career, uh, to me, <laughs> there's a lot of very potential flaws in that plan to say the least. So, yeah, I, I think it's a very fair uh, suggestion by that fan. I agree. Uh, I've said too, not only just stressing, they're going to play the kids, but if you're those players, right? Like you're, you're in the back nine, whatever hole of your career, you're not in any rush to go work out and lift and move to Foxborough or some town that's close there to work out and then take a break over the summer and then come back in for camp to run outside zone or scat protections or max protections or slide or whatever their schemes are going to do, because you know, all of the schemes, they're just called different things because that's how offense works in the NFL. So let me take my time, work it on my own, you know, count the money I've already made and then see who needs me and maybe stoke a bidding more if my agent can play things the right way versus the Patriots or other tackle needy teams because virtually every team in the league right now would take a tackle. So the part of the equation is not just the Patriots extending an offer, which I think they should do agree. Uh, but is that player willing to accept the offer? How much is it? And what what is the leverage in all these conversations? Because if a core four uh, and or Caden Wallace really struggle in weeks one or two, I have hoped and predicted that they will act on this. I might be wrong. They waited till end of August to panic trade for Vidarian Lowe and Tyrone Wheelie Jr. Last year, and we saw how that went. I just hope there's not, uh, a, you know, a repeat of that. But I think the players involved here that are mentioned, Donovan Smith and Charles Leno, are much better than what we saw from Vidarian Lowe and uh, didn't really see at all from, from Tyrone Wheatley Jr. Yeah, and they're not going to have pads on these next few weeks of OTAs and minicamp. But maybe they'll have enough of an assessment about Caden Wallace in particular, when it comes to footwork. Is he on the same page as these other offensive linemen? Is he making progress in terms of playing that left spot of the line? Or do we see a huge difference in how comfortable he is when we rotate him in at right tackle? Again, just even in the walkthroughs over the course of these next few weeks, does that give them a, an assessment of him where they feel, okay, you know what? We can't bank on this. We've got to go out now. And like you said, these veteran tackles, tackles leno smith they've been through a million training camp practices they, they, they're in no rush to sign we saw last year the, i know it's running back but ezekiel Elliott came in he didn't miss a step as a running back when he joined the patriots and joined practices in green bay these guys i'm sure could come in here as long as they're keeping themselves in shape and they have you know they haven't uh completely gone off uh, the, the wagon in terms of their their nutrition and, and their training regimen then it makes a lot of sense that they would wait. And I think for the Patriots too, they, they give, gives them a chance to have a fairer assessment of, of these other players that are considering now, just see how they, how do they do things in the spring when we ask them to do X, Y, and Z uh, and, and, you know, without another guy taking up their reps. Yeah. Not to mention they have a ton of tackles on the roster right now. So none of them might be as good as the two players mentioned, but they intend to find out if they can develop any of these players with a new offense, a new offensive line coach, a new offensive coordinator, and some guys like Wheatley Jr., who were developmental players to begin with last year, got hurt, have since shed, I think, around 15 pounds of fat and and are very athletic. Like that dude played tight end in college. I wrote a story about it last year going, oh, is this you know, secret weapon for dude who played tight end at Stony Brook and had maybe a dozen catches is not secret weapon enough, but looks like a guy who could be your extra tackle and six offensive line on balance line formations and maybe just kind of leak out in the red zone and catch a touchdown pass. Uh, but we shall see. And we will have time to see in OTAs, mini camp. First OTA practice is Monday. I will have a podcast recapping that practice here. Uh, are you going to be at practice Monday? I plan to. Excellent. All right. We will see you then. Hopefully we will see Spicy Bob. And then thank you to him. <laughs> thank you to your measured broadcaster, voice of the Patriots, Bob Sosie. Listen and read him on 98.5 The Sports Hub. Uh, thank you for being a friend. Thank you for being a guest and making for some time with us today. Andrew, thanks for having me on. Appreciate it.